Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's live stream legal show. Today, we're going to focus on a sad tragedy that involved a big law associate who had a very promising career working as an associate for DLA Piper. His name was David Messer Schmidt. And he was a young attorney, age 30, who had graduated recently from Boston University Law School. And David had sort of been like a perfect student. Um, everybody liked him. He was always at the top of the class. He worked hard. He grew up around Cincinnati, ended up going to Ohio State University. He was also the drum major when he was in high school. He rode on the crew team at OSU. And that is how he met his wife. Her name is Kim Vong. So after undergrad, David went directly to law school. Uh, of course, he graduated with honors from college. And then he graduated again with honors from Boston University Law School. So um, his life was just full of prestige, winning awards, making friends, just by all accounts, he was a very successful, well-liked person. He had a good sense of humor. He had a family who loved him. And he had recently gotten married a couple of years before. Unfortunately, he was found dead in a hotel room on the fourth floor of the Donovan Hotel in Washington, D.C. So this happened just roughly about seven years ago. It was all in the news. It created quite a stir because at first, when David Messerschmidt's body was found by the hotel cleaning staff one morning, um, I believe it was February 10th of 2015, um, people had no idea like what had happened. His wife didn't even know where he was. So um, let's back up there for a little bit, um, just based on the timeline that I recall. Um, he was working at DLA Piper, which is one of the most prestigious law firms in the whole country. It has um, maybe roughly 40 different offices throughout the whole entire world in different countries. Um, very difficult to get this type of job. But um, since David had graduated with honors at the top of his class, he had also clerked for a federal district court judge in Ohio, um, worked for a law firm, also very prestigious. I believe it was Brown Mayer in Chicago before he moved to DC. So he was working at DLA Piper, which is um, maybe around 8th Street in downtown DC. And that day, he left work roughly, roughly around 530 and went off to the Donovan Hotel, um, which was totally unknown to his wife, Kim Vong. Um, he then texted his wife at around 734 p.m. and said he planned on being home back to their Capitol Hill apartment by roughly around 830 p.m. So she thought, oh, OK, everything's fine. I'm sure she was used to him working long hours, especially since he was always working for big law firms after his federal clerkships or federal clerkship ended. So um, lo and behold, he does not come home. His wife is beside herself, and she ended up calling the police at around 1.50 in the morning in the middle of the night saying, I have no idea where my husband is. He said he was going to be home at around 8.30 p.m. I don't know if he had any plans. He didn't say that he planned on going anywhere else other than work and then home. Um, she had no idea he was at the Donovan Hotel, which was just a few miles away from where they lived. And um, so unfortunately, it was the um, poor housekeeper, somebody that worked for housekeeping at the hotel that found David partially clothed on the floor of this fourth floor hotel room at the Donovan Hotel, which um, I understand has now been fully renovated. And they have also conveniently changed the hotel's name. So it is now known as Hotel Xena. So um, yeah, you do wonder, you know, how the hotel's business may have suffered after being the scene of such a horrendous crime. Um, so it was a big mystery because, number one, the wife had no idea what was going on. And then her husband, David, is found in the hotel room. Um, media reports later did mention that he was found in the room with condoms and lubricant and an enema kit, um, along with deodorant. His wallet was there. 
um, his laptop computer was there. So um, yeah, just a total mystery. It's like, okay, so it sort of looks like he was hooking up with someone, but who could it have been? Because, you know, wife was totally um, shocked by this. She said multiple times to the media that they had a wonderful marriage. He was like the best husband. He was her best friend and that she loved him. And she was totally clueless as to who would have wanted to kill her husband. I mean, much less, you know, she certainly did not suspect him of having an affair. They had only been married about two and a half years when this happened. Um, so the mystery was even more confusing confounded because they could not even tell on the security camera footage, was this person of interest male or female? So the person of interest, I'm going to show you, uh, let's share some pictures here because pictures are worth a thousand words, right? So um, thank you guys all for being here, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate your support. Let me try to bring up this. This is from the Daily Mail, I think. Yeah. Okay. So this here is a picture of the Donovan Hotel, which is on 14th Street. They say it's in Thomas Circle. You know, I used to live in D.C. for quite a while, but um, I don't recall ever going to this specific area before. So that's a hotel. It's beautiful. It has a nice little outdoor pool, you know, kind of a swanky place. And so the person of interest, which um, they didn't know if it was male or female, is this person here. I hope you can see that on the screen. And some people online said the person appears to be maybe Polynesian or mixed race or Hispanic. Um, was it a young man or was it a young woman? Uh, the person, you know, was clearly all dressed up in winter attire because this was February 9th. And the person was seen first at the elevator uh, right around like say 7.40, 7.40 p.m. And uh, this person was also later seen going up the stairs to go into, um, into the hotel room area. So um, kind of stupid here because <laughs> Um, I think this young person who actually was the one that murdered David Messerschmidt um, probably thought that there were no security cameras in the stairwell, but um, little did this person know that um, there are cameras everywhere. And so this finally started circulating and David's poor wife, Kim, had to um, give a press conference pleading with people to help identify this person, come forward with any information if you happen to be around the hotel um, on that night of February 9th. Um, here's another image that was caught by the hotel surveillance camera where the, um, the attacker is there walking near the elevator. And there's, there the person is going up the stairs again. Yeah. So, um, once clues started coming out, then it looks like law enforcement was quickly able to zero in on the person who had actually murdered David Messerschmidt. Um, apparently what was going on behind the scenes was that law enforcement was working with the wife to scramble around, try to find any sort of information around the house. She found a tablet that he had been using and um, Again, to her surprise, it turned out that David had been using um, a secret Gmail account. He had a secret Google Voice phone number that he was using to hook up with men on Craigslist as well as through Grindr. Um, I guess it's a um, male hookup type of app. Um, if anybody's familiar with that, please let me know in the, <laughs> in the comments. But um, okay, so I'm not that familiar with Grindr. Um, I have heard of Craigslist. As far as I know, Craigslist no longer has those kinds of sexual personal ads or personal ads anymore after so many people got um, assaulted or, or even murdered because of these Craigslist hookups. 
So, um, so once law enforcement was able to look through this tablet that the wife provided to them, that's when they found out about the secret Gmail account, the secret Google Voice phone number, and saw that David had been emailing back and forth that day. Well, I guess he wasn't working that hard at the big law firm billing the hours that day on February 9th, but he had been communicating with someone through Craigslist Personals. Um, the email that was used was something like Chris Sanchez 0906 or something at yahoo.com. So this so-called Chris Sanchez person emailed David a picture, an alleged picture of his torso, and they agreed that they were going to hook up at the Hotel Donovan that night sometime between 7 to 7.30. So, um, so that explained why David did not go straight home after, after working. I'm kind of surprised that he was able to leave work so early at 5.30 that day, uh, especially when he had not been very productive. Instead, he had been trying to hook up or find some, some sex partner for himself during the day. Um, so then they had to figure out, okay, so who is this so-called Chris Sanchez person? So meanwhile, these pictures from the surveillance camera were being circulated all over the greater DC media, um, as well as internationally too. You know, now that we have the World Wide Web and a lot of different internet forums and everything. So um, there were some internet forums where I believe some men actually anonymously wrote that, um, you know, that victim looks like somebody that I had a Craigslist hookup with or grinder hookup with uh, um, half a year ago or something. So apparently David had been having multiple sexual encounters with strangers through the internet. And unfortunately, he was the victim of this catfishing, you know, this kind of um, internet fraud where um, turned out it was actually a young woman named Jamira Gauman who was desperately in need of money to help her and her lesbian partner, Dominique Johnson. They needed money to help pay the rent. So they cooked up a scheme to uh, respond to some Craigslist sex ads and then rob the victim. So, um, but I'm not exactly sure why, but ultimately Jamira was the one that was supposed to rob the victim and Dominique did not go up into the hotel. She was the lookout person. She just kind of hung outside the Hotel Donovan while this was taking place. And as far as I know, Dominique did not think or have any idea that Jamira was going to commit murder. She was just outside thinking, okay, she's gonna rob this, this doofus that we found through Craigslist, get some money, and then off we go. So um, Jamira went upstairs, and of course, we only have her side of the story. And I don't fully believe her side of the story, but um, then again, I'm not entirely clear on all the fine details of everything because when David was found partially nude, partially clothed, um, he had been stabbed about seven times and one of the stab wounds was about five inches deep. It was so deep that it actually um, went into part of his spine. And from what I read, he did have multiple multicolored tiny little zip ties on his fingers. And these zip ties look just like the ones that were later found in Jamira's apartment or wherever she lived. Um, she lived in DC with Dominique. And so Jamira basically said that she went there to rob the guy. And then when David realized that it was not a male sex partner that had shown up, then he got upset and, um, and kind of grabbed her by her arm, which triggered some PTSD, some memory of when she had been assaulted in the past. So she flipped out. She took out the knife that she had with her and started stabbing like crazy. So um, ultimately, poor David was stabbed about seven times. Like I said, it was um, in his torso as well as his groin. There were defensive wounds seen on his hands or his arms. And Jamira ended up leaving with $40 in cash and his smart trip his metro card which dominique later used to um go to her job or just to go places on the metro for about six weeks um until she used up his metro card so um uh, was that worth it you know i mean she also took his cell phone 
So um, that was found in her apartment later on by law enforcement. And the funny thing was that when Jamira's picture was being circulated throughout the media, one of her friends saw it and actually approached her and said, Jamira, that, that really, that looks like you in the picture. And Jamira just laughed it off and said, you know, girl, that's not me. I'm planning on going to the army. Okay. So at the time, Jamira had been working as mall security at a shopping mall in the DC suburbs, but I'm not sure if she was um, laid off or fired or something, or was she currently still being employed? But, um, you know, they were definitely having some financial issues. She was only 21 and Dominique was only 19 at the time when the murder occurred. So um, things actually happened pretty quickly because um, I think Jamira might have been and Dominique might have been arrested within a couple of months after David's body was found. And then they both pleaded guilty and they were sentenced sometime in the late summer or early fall of 2015. So things really happened quickly after um, they were able to track down who had done this to David. So, um, yeah. Oh, thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you, TXC Tells All. Exactly. Yeah, well, it is kind of hard to tell. I mean, with, with this big bulky jacket on and the, the pants and stuff, I mean, it's hard to tell. Is that a young man or, or a young woman? Yeah, I feel bad for David's wife more than play stupid yet. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it goes without saying that, you know, what are the takeaways from this horrible case? I mean, it's just so incredibly sad because I read the obituary, which clearly, you know, did not include all these sordid details of why David Messer Schmidt was murdered or the circumstances or anything, but it just painted him as this, you know, really wonderful family oriented guy. His in-laws loved him. His parents loved him. He had two brothers. His wife said he was her best friend and soulmate. Um, they had both been on the crew team together when they were at OSU. And I mean, at least they didn't have any kids, right? Um, so the wife was not an attorney. She seems to be in the medical profession, maybe as a physician's assistant. And um, just doing a little bit of sleuthing, it, it looks like her family is, well, obviously from Vietnam, but... Um, she seems to either have been born in the U.S. or came to the U.S. at a very early age because she didn't have an accent. And her family might have owned a restaurant around Florida. And um, looks like some of her siblings were also in the medical field as nurse practitioners or pharmacists. Um, nice, well-educated family. I'm sure they did not expect to be thrown into the limelight because of this horrible tragedy that's also very embarrassing for the victim as well as the victim's wife. Um, so I hope she's been able to, you know, somehow cope and, and move on with her life despite this happening to her husband. Um, so let's take a look here. Um, Yeah, this is a picture of David and his wife, Kim Vong. Um, it says he was found stabbed to death inside a boutique hotel in D.C. Police were unclear of the motive back then. Um, Vong asked the public for help in solving the mystery surrounding her husband's death. The world has lost a good person, David's family, a son and brother. And I have lost everything, my husband and my best friend. In one day, I lost the most important person in my life and the man I love so much. And I have no answers, she said. Okay. So there have definitely been like some other cases that um, are sort of similar to this. Um, one thing that came to mind is the case involving the KTLA anchor. His name is Christopher Burris, who was also found dead in a hotel room. His wife was also Vietnamese American, um, although they had been married much longer and they had a young daughter. So apparently that guy, Chris Burris, had also been having all these um, gay sexual en encounters with random guys. Um, except in this case, um, in the Chris Burris case, he was not 
murdered. He was there voluntarily with a sex partner that he had met on the internet. He was into s and and drugs. And um, there was a disco ball and a massage table involved um, and a bunch of drugs that I think uh, the person he was paying was supposed to like stick into his rectum. So um, yeah, well, there goes my monetization on this, <laughs> this video, right? But but in the Chris Burroughs case, um, boy, so embarrassing for, for his family and his poor wife and the kid that will probably already hear about this someday. But um, so he died from a drug overdose. And so there, I don't know, I mean, what, what is this uncanny similarity between these men on the down low and their Vietnamese American wives and their, their weird sordid tales and stuff uh, when they seem so perfect on the outside? But um, let's see, let's check out some of the comments here. Yeah, that's right. He still didn't deserve to get murdered. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it looks like um, getting back to David Messerschmidt. Um, looks like he had already been doing these kinds of um, risky sexual encounters for years. It, I mean, he could have been doing that even before he got married. Um, yeah, and obviously it, it didn't wind up in any sort of physical assault until the, the, the final hookup that he had. Yeah. Um, no, the wife never reacted publicly. She was there. Um, well, first law enforcement asked her to take part in some sort of... Um, you know, like a press um, media meeting um, to try to plead for more clues and to bring more attention. This was before Jamira was the actual named suspect. And then later on, she was there at the sentencing in the courtroom crying. And um, I don't think she spoke with the media. So, um, I mean, clearly she still loved him. She still had feelings for him. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's really tough because in her memories, her time spent with him was all like, you know, that of being in love and being with your husband and, and thinking that, you know, we have a great relationship. Yeah. So she never said anything publicly addressing that, but it sounded like it was a total surprise to her. Yeah, some of the lawyer deaths have similar background. Yeah, if the world was not so homophobic, you wouldn't have so many people who feel the need to be in the closet. Yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of like, well, you know, if so many people loved him and he had friends and he was successful, then why couldn't he just be a successful, out and proud gay man? You know, why did he have to, you know, get married to this poor lady and, and mess up her life too and then wind up, you know, killed by by somebody who catfished him on craigslist you know like i guess he felt a lot of pressure because he was always so high achieving and everything and maybe he did feel the vibes from you know people in the legal community or who knows if his family had made any sort of like comments or whatever but either way you know he felt like he would be better off just being married to a woman so you know i mean obviously that didn't work out well right yeah yeah, definitely. There was some weird stuff going on. There was a lot of, um, I don't know, yeah, a lot of uh, perversion going on there with the people that are are suspected of having killed him also. Yeah. His wife handled it right in my, yeah, that's right. I mean, ultimately, she wanted to get to the bottom of it and figure out, you know, who had, who had murdered her husband. So, um, you know, that was very brave of her. Um, to set aside her own inner turmoil and then still, you know, get up in front of microphone knowing that everybody's like looking at her and people across the world or the whole country are going to see this and think certain things. And um, she she just ultimately wanted justice for her husband. Yeah. Everyone got a secret. If I die, I'll leave my browser history. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a way, it was kind of good that the wife found his tablet and then law enforcement somehow was able to get in and then find all his emails and his Google phone number and stuff. Yeah. Um, you still shouldn't get married, though, and drag someone else into the ice. Yeah, correct. I agree. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's see. So ultimately, what happened? So Jamara Gallman only 21 years old. I mean, this is what's so sad. So I did read up about Jamira too. 
And everybody was surprised that Jamira was the perpetrator, that she had actually stabbed this 30 year old lawyer to death, you know, because she was known to be this like calm, cool, collected, nice, nice girl. Um, she had gone to some sort of military academy in Maryland. I'm not sure if it was like a charter school or something, but she was a high school graduate. And I saw at least one or two pictures of her at high school graduation, you know, looking all happy with flowers and stuff. And, um, you know, she had parents who were both involved in her life. And when people were approached by the media to talk about her, people who knew her actually were stunned and they would say, no, not, not Jamira. Like she was a, she was like a star basketball player in high school. And even her high school basketball coach was quoted in some of the news news articles talking about like what a nice girl she was. And um, she, she didn't seem to have a temper. She was laid back. She got along with everybody. So um, it's just so sad. It's like, why did she snap? Why did she think that um, it would be a good idea to just go online and rob people and, and then start stabbing and stabbing away? You know, it wasn't like one stab to get the guy away from him if he had indeed grabbed her arm. Um, you know, instead she stabbed him many, many times um, and then just left him like that for $40, a smart trip card and his cell phone, which, you know, was basically not worth any money. She didn't even sell it or do anything with it. Yeah. So let's take a look at the sentencing information. So Jamira will still be just about maybe 45 years old when she gets out of prison. She's in prison in West Virginia now. And then her her partner, Dominique, um, has already been out of prison for a long time. She only served about six months, um, you know, just mainly because, you know, she was saying that she had no idea that Shamira was going to murder somebody. That was not anything that they had talked about or, you know, planned on doing. And all Dominique did was, you know, stand outside the hotel. So this says... Uh, Jamira was sentenced to 24 years in prison for the February 9th, 2015 murder of David Metzer Schmidt in a robbery at a downtown Washington hotel. She pled guilty on May 27, 2015 in the Superior Court of D.C. to a charge of second degree murder while armed. The plea, which was contingent upon the court's approval, called for a sentence between 18 to 25 years. The Honorable Michael Ryan accepted the plea today and sentenced Galman accordingly. Upon completion of her 24-year prison term, Gallman will be placed on five years of supervised release. Also, Judge Ryan sentenced Dominique Johnson, 19, for her role in events on the day of the crime. Johnson pled guilty to a charge of conspiracy to commit robbery. Judge Ryan sentenced Johnson to a year of incarceration, but suspended all but six months of that time on the condition that she successfully complete three years of probation. Jamira Gallman planned and carried out a cold-hearted scam to trick De David Messerschmidt for the purpose of robbing him, said acting U.S. Attorney Cohen. Then she repeatedly stabbed him when he tried to fight back. After leaving Mr. Messerschmidt to die from his wounds, she met up with Dominique Johnson, and they rode a bus home together with the proceeds of the crime. The sentences handed down today both hold both of them accountable for their callous crimes and hopefully will warn others who are even considering such senseless violence. So um, this really, really sad story here. Um, I just thought that it would be interesting to cover this since, um, you know, this is a legal channel. He was a um, very successful attorney. Um, and as a side note, you know, when I heard about this, me being sort of like a bitter graduate of Georgetown Law School <laughs> who had a really tough time finding good jobs for a number of years before I went solo. Um, you know, I mean, another takeaway from this, uh, besides don't try to have anonymous sex hookups with strangers, um, is that sometimes it doesn't really matter as much what undergrad school you go to, because if you go to a, an easier college, 
then it will probably be easier for you to graduate with honors and be at the top of the class and get into a better law school. Um, same thing for law schools. Um, Boston University Law School, I recently looked it up. It's ranked about number 20 in the nation now. And even if you don't go to say like a um, top 10 or top 14 law school, if you are in that coveted say 5% or 10% of the class, then you still have a pretty good shot at getting federal clerkships and getting a big law job. Although um, I'm not sure how David enjoyed that um, type of career or if, if he was on his way to making partner or something, unfortunately we'll never know. Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the sentence? Was the suspect's partner? All yeah, yeah. So she was also arrested. Um, yeah, so we just went over the sentence of 24 years for Jamira, followed by probation. And then it was basically six months in prison for Dominique Johnson. Um, if I may, I think we need to stop any thinking that these families should be should feel embarrassed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they they had nothing to do with it. Yeah. And it seems like they all loved him very much. And, um, you know, he had either nieces or nephews that he got along great with that was mentioned in his obituary. So he's definitely more, you know, more than just just the sordid crime, you know, and unfortunately, you know, people most people know about him because of the way he died as opposed to the way that he lived. Yeah. What's the rationale of some states when they give really give full sentences to people who are present to but perhaps unaware? Hmm. OK. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking back. It's been so long since I took criminal law. Um, I don't practice criminal defense or anything. But I think if um, like even if you didn't intend to actually um, kill somebody or you didn't think that somebody was going to get killed during the commission of a crime, if you did something where it was likely to happen or um, or it was still like something that was causally connected, you know, for example, like um, going to rob somebody or kidnap somebody with a gun and then the gun accidentally goes off or something, you know, I think the intent can also be inferred. Um, and there's still culpability there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job explaining this, but I, I think like in, in some circumstances, um, you can still be um, found responsible for the murder of someone, even if you went into the crime, not expecting somebody to be killed. Yeah, but um, obviously if there's any criminal defense attorney out there that wants to explain it better, please do. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, definitely a slap on the wrist. Um, I'm not sure what, Dominique is doing now or or if she ever turned her life around, I sure hope so. Yeah, totally. Okay. So um yeah, interesting case there. And uh let's hope that um that these things just stop happening because um as another aside, I remember when a friend of mine was telling me when I was uh, doing the, you know, dating apps and stuff, she, she told me, yeah, you got to tell somebody, you know, like if you're going to meet somebody for the first time, you need to at least tell me or tell another friend or, or your relative where you're going and who you're meeting with and, and always meet in a public place. So I always tell that to, to my female friends or, or, you know, even male friends too, you know, there have been some cases recently in Raleigh where someone met, so a stranger through Craigslist to sell a car. And that poor man who was probably at least six feet tall ended up being held at gunpoint and forced back into his car. And, you know, he was murdered and then the person stole his car. So, um, yeah, you can't be too careful out there when, whenever you're meeting a stranger, whether it's for, you know, a sexual encounter or dating or selling something. So always think about your safety, you know, maybe if you're selling something, just meet outside the police station. Um, I know my local police station even has designated spots for people to do these kinds of sales because there are surveillance cameras everywhere. And, um, you know, when people drive up, then obviously their license plates are being captured also. So, um, and then sometimes you might think that, well, it's not even worth trying to sell something because, you know, is that worth the risk of my own personal safety where I have to potentially drive over to someplace and then 
risk getting assaulted or getting robbed or whatever. So um, anyway, yeah, let's all stay safe out there. Let's not do anything um, kind of um, haphazard or silly. And um, seeing that there are no other comments out there, I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream show. Um, oh yeah, meet at McDonald's. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, if the people at McDonald's are okay with you just like sitting around a while to, um, yeah, but nobody has any guns and I don't know how good their security cameras are at McDonald's. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you're selling, but um, these days, most most of the um, police stations will allow you to just meet outside at a designated spot outside the police station to, to sell whatever you want to sell. Or, um, or sometimes it might be easier for you to just like sell stuff at consignment sales or to a pawn shop or sell it on eBay or whatever, instead of doing these face-to-face -face things. Yeah, because there was one time I, I needed to buy something and um, the guy wanted to meet first at, um, at a Starbucks which I thought was kind of weird, but but now I think, you know, it makes sense that you don't want to just directly tell people, okay, well, come on over to my house. Here's my, here's my address and come on over and the door will be unlocked and you come up and look at the property or whatever, you know, I mean, it really depends what you're selling and stuff, but yeah, always safety first. You know, unfortunately you do have to kind of be suspicious of people and always kind of think the worst like okay worst case scenario is the person could have a gun and force me into the car or you know do something so yeah so watch out for your safety first don't worry if it makes you seem a little too hyper vigilant or or a little weird <laughs> so it doesn't matter okay so um next live stream i'm not really sure when we'll do that because i have some family stuff going on next weekend so probably in a couple of weeks um maybe we'll talk about federal eeo cases because there were a few people that were sort of interested in that even though that's a very, very niche topic, or um, maybe just have some random, you know, ask me almost anything legal type of show. If you have any other ideas, please drop me a line in the comments, because um, I'm always trying to think of some new and different topics to talk about. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening then. Thanks for being here.